Okay, so I'll start again. Um, so in, 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 in this uh, first part of this session, I will talk about the graph guessing games, graph guessing numbers actually, and then uh, causal networks. So I think the highlight will be a result that Shannon's information inequalities, uh, they are sort of insufficient to give uh, upper, uh, perfect upper bounds on, on, on these uh, guessing numbers. So I will actually start with a class of problems that really looks very recreational. It's the kind of things you actually find in newspaper columns or things like that. And, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's a type of a, it's a kind of hat guessing games, but when you say hat guessing games, people often misunderstand, confuse it with other hat guessing games that are quite different in nature. So what is it about? It's, so, but it turns out that this recreational problem goes straight to, to important issues in information theory and network coding. It's a bit surprising. The problem looks very innocent, you know, from first, but it actually goes to... And this guessing game, uh, in the first version I did with Michael Torop in 97, he says, apparently he doesn't remember he did it when... That was, I, sent you, I sent you a number of emails about it, but probably you can re recognize your own contribution at some stage, but... <laughs> but anyway, this was a long time before... <laughs> yeah. We didn't publish it and, uh, or anything like that, and it was only, we only looked at it, it was a very banal example, actually, so probably lots of people have been aware of that even before, I mean, so I, I don't know actually who to credit for this basic thing, but we have like n players, and they, imagine they each have a die with s side, let's say s is six, so they have a, a dice, each of them, and uh, and the idea is now the rules are that each player roll the dice. And then the players are not allowed to see the value of their own die, but it's allowed to look at the values of all the other n minus 1 players' dice. You can also put it this way, that each of them randomly get assigned a die value in the foreheads, and they can see all the other players' uh, values, but they cannot see their own. Uh, the players, well, maybe I should say that uh, if they all are correct, then, uh, well, they all have to guess simultaneously. It's not like many other head games where they can learn something from people's hesitations or passes or something like that. Uh, in this case, they all at the same time have to make a guess about their own value. And uh, they have to do that simultaneously. And the rules are such that the outcome is that if, if every player guess correctly, then they win, basically. Then they win the big prize. Uh, otherwise, they lose. So it doesn't matter if if almost everybody is correct. No good. They have all to be correct, or, or, or to, to win the prize. And uh, but the point is that they are allowed in advance to agree on some kind of guessing strategy. They, they can meet the day before, and they're told the next day they're going to play this head game, and if they all win, all guess correctly, they win this big, big prize money. The question is, what kind of, uh, what should they do, I mean? Did some of you haven't seen the problem before? I mean, maybe you can have a suggestion, or? I think these are typical interview questions. If you want a job at Microsoft or things like that, you probably, they might ask you that kind of question, you know, so. So it's a, it's really like a recreational type of problem, but, um, uh, so let, let's, let's uh, assume that n is 100 and that we have a, a normal uh, die you know, with six sides. So, what, so you might ask, what's the probability that each player guess correctly their own value of the hat? And uh, the naive uh, but wrong answer is based on the following kind of correct premises. I mean, so here is how you would normally maybe how you might reason, you say, okay, uh, each player have no information about their own die value. Okay, so that's correct. I mean, you don't know, not, you don't know anything about your own value. It's also correct that you have a sixth probability of guessing your own value. It, it cannot be changed because we assume that these dice are independently, so you learn nothing from looking at the other dice, and you, you just have a sixth probability. And also the dice values are independent, that's an assumption, that is simply, we, we, there's no correlation whatsoever between the different dice values. 
Uh, and now the conclusion, but that is a false conclusion, is that the probability that each player guessed correctly is 1 6 to the 100. That, of course, people are shaking their heads, some people, but, but the point is that uh, I know every time I give this talk, uh, it's actually interesting. If I give it in a computer science department, sorry to say that, I know I might get into trouble now, so maybe I should be a bit careful, but for some audiences, let me put it this way, uh, they just, it just passed and no, nobody noticed. In a maths department, immediately you have people, no, no, there's a mistake in the definition, you know. So that's the first reaction. And then in this uh, capacity crowd here, people are, of course, immediately seeing the right solution are just sitting nodding their heads, you know, so. So this is like a history of the problem, or you think? Or? No, that's but, uh, not, not yeah, there are different variations of it. I think recently there was another variation of this hat game, and it was a big news on the newspapers, actually, that some uh, uh, AI system, a bit like uh, Dr. Watson, or some Watson, or what is it called from, uh, actually solved that problem, or something like that. It wasn't Watson, I'm, I'm insulting somebody now, but it was some other system, you know, so. So um, anyway, uh, but let's check the arguments. Uh, so this premise that you each have no relevant information about the, uh, your own diet, that is correct. You learn absolutely nothing about your own diet value just by looking at the other ones. And also it's correct that you have one sixth probability of guessing your own value. You cannot change that, even if you win a prize for guessing wrong, I mean, you cannot change the fact. In one sixth of the cases, you just guess it. You have absolutely no influence on that. And also the values are independent. So what is, why is this conclusion false? So let's see, uh, let's say that x set i is a probability, or the, sorry, the stochastic variable that is 1 if the player guessed correctly, and otherwise it's, it's 0. Then what we conclude, one of the premises is that the probability of each of those values is uh, 1 is, uh, uh, is exactly a 6 for all these different people. So that's correct. And when do the players win? Let's write it down formally. They win if all of these players guess correctly. So this is a set one is just a stochastic variable that is one if the player guess correctly. And you can see that the condition for all the players to win is that every single person guess their own uh, value correctly. So that is that this huge conjunction, all, are, all is satisfied. We want to calculate that probability. But uh, But now we can do the, what you call it, the, the chain rule. So we can start to condition things on the last thing. And uh, it turns out that we can actually get, we can, the only upper bound we can get is 1, 6. So actually, let me explain how they can arrange it so they actually get that 6 with a certainty. So what they can do, I mean, it's of course a very simple solution. Uh, what they can do is that they can simply assume beforehand, the day before, they agree on the parity of, or, or the, the, the value mod 6 of the sum of all the dice throws. So uh, they, uh, they arrange it in such, the idea is that they arrange it in such a way that either they're all right or all wrong at the same time. So what they can do is that they simply say the day before, you know, when they set up the protocol, they say, okay, let's assume that the number of, total number of, 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 of dice values, the total value is divisible by 6, for example. That actually happens one out of six cases. But you see, if, the, if it happens to be the case that the sum can be divided by six, then every single person gets correctly, otherwise they're all wrong. So they simply just manage to co correlate the guesses. So each a player assumes that the sum of all the dice values is zero, mod six, and then they guess accordingly. So this is, of course, just looks like a rec 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 recreational problem. Uh, so by cooperating, they can actually, so here is a, now I want to introduce this thing called the guessing number. So we, we can, let's compare how they actually, what they can actually achieve with what we would expect them to achieve naively if they just did uncoordinated random guessing. You can see so they can achieve 1 divided by uh, s, 1 divided by 6, but actually we, we would expect that it was 1 divided by uh, 
s to the power n, I mean, one is six to the 100, you know, so that was what we would expect. So they're actually doing a, s, a six to the 99 times better than we would expect it. And that uh, exponent there, the 99, is what is called the guessing number for the graph. It turns out that plays an important role when you start to apply this uh, recreational type of mathematics. So this is going to play an important role in our theory, this exponent. So this is, so then I didn't think more about this, and then a number of years later, I sort of started to ask myself, I mean, it came up again, quite interesting, these kind of problems, just by looking at other problems, uh, I realized that uh, it was actually interesting to understand what's happening if you, they play this game on a directed graph in general. So instead of doing it on a complete graph, now they cannot see all the other hats. They can only see some, a subset of the hats. So they can only, in this directed graph, they can only see uh, the hat colors of the direct uh, uh, predecessors. And the, again, the players have to get simultaneously and want to maximize the probability that they're all correct. And they win if everybody's correct, otherwise they lose. Of course, there are variations of this. You can look, what if just one player have to be correct? And you can look at a lot of other variations. But it turns out that these variations, even though you can ask them, are very different mathematically. And all, a lot of the nice properties of this version of the game, I, I'm not aware of any sort of, it, you, you, the link to information theory, for example, seem to be completely lost if you start to ask these other questions. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, but it's, it, it's a, uh, so again, I mean, they have to choose this strategy in advance. So, so this is a general definition of a guessing number of a graph. So we have a graph. Uh, so we play, we, 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 uh, or you can say, if you have a strategy for these p players who play on the graph, we want to calculate what is the guessing number of that strategy. It's simply that exponent they can do better than what you would expect it if they just did uncoordinated random guessings. So actually, you're always comparing s to the power n if you have a, a, a graph with n nodes. With, with, with the actual probability, and, and that factor is the guessing number. Uh, so for example, for the complete graph with bidirected edges, that was exactly what we looked at before. Uh, and there is a proposition, I mean, well, this is very simple, that the guessing number for the complete graph is simply n minus 1. Well, we saw for 100 it was 99, you know, it's just n minus 1. They just and also we notice that the, the guessing number in this case does not depend on the size of the alphabet. It turns out for many, many graphs, this guessing number is not, does not depend on the alphabet. For some graphs, it depends on the alphabet, but then asymptotically when the alphabet size goes to infinity, you can pr prove that it converts to a specific number, but I think that comes on one of the following slides. So here is a, a cycle. What can they do now? So here's a question for you. So suppose we are now sitting around a table and you can only see, let's say, the hat color of the person to your left. <coughs> and again, the group have to come up with a strategy so they maximize the probability that all of them guess correctly their own hat. So what, what uh, could they do? I mean, so. I mean, you could think about it, it could be coin flips. It could just be they had a red or a blue hat. And you can just see the hat to the, your next. So. So the question is, they cannot do so well. I mean, that, let me immediately, if you're very am ambitious and want to do some incredible thing, I can already now reveal that it's quite re remarkable. They cannot do very well, but they can do better than. Yes, you have a suggestion now? OK, so, oh. Everyone has the same. Yeah, exactly. Same what they, what they want, exactly. So one way, what they can do, for example, uh, is that they simply guess as if they have the same head color as the one they see. Well, they're not doing very well, but they're definitely doing better than if they did random guessing. They're actually doing a factor s better than random guessing, uh, uncoordinated random guessing, because if all of them are the same, then they win. Otherwise, they don't win. But that's s times, if, if it's a dice, it's six times better than if they just did it uncoordinatedly. So this means that the guessing number for a directed cycle is one. So for this one, now it's bidirected. It's two, it turns out. And it's very, uh, let's see, what would they do now? Now you can, you're sitting around a table, they have five, they have four people, and they can see the hats, the person both to the left and to the right. 
So the question is, how would they guess? And uh, it turns out that it can achieve, uh, I mean, for the lower bound, we just simply devise a guessing strategy. But for the upper bound, that's where it's interesting. That's where the inform information theory come into the picture soon. So you see, for, for this case, it, it turns out, well, what can they do? Suppose we have two, two players. Let's do an even simpler graph. We just have two players. And suppose now that he has a stochastic variable x and he has a stochastic variable y being assumed. And we want to make sure that this person can, this value of this is determined by this value. And this value is determined by this value. We can write it down like the entropy of x given y is 0 and the entropy of y given x is 0. So we can actually, in this very simple case, we can actually draw a little picture. And then I have to refer to some other talks that have been here. But we can think about it like we have the variable x here and the variable y here. So really what this is saying is that this is 0, this is 0. So actually, all the information is like the common information between x and y. That's what, what information we have here. Uh, that information is exactly, in some sense, a measure for what they can achieve in this guessing game. So that is, this is, we have, if we want to maximize the entropy, we actually want to maximize what we have inside this area. So uh, in this case, it's, well, what turns out, if you have a, two people and they have a hat each, we, of course, they're using the same strategy as we used for the n equals 100 before. They just simply guess, well, in this case, they can guess they have the same value <laughs> as the other one. Or they can guess that the sum is zero mod six or something. I mean, and then the point is they are, they are simply correct in uh, the, the guessing number is one actually. For this one, the guessing number is one. They're simply doing s times better than you would expect for the random co one coordinated random guessing. So this one has guessing number one. But now let's look at uh, this graph. Here we can achieve guessing number two, and here's a very simple way to do it. You simply split the guessing into this part and this part, for example. So this one achieve guessing number one, and this one achieve guessing number one. That means they have a strategy. They just simply ignore this information here. This link is being ignored. This one has guessing number two. So this gives a lower bound of guessing of, of two for the guessing number, because you can just split the graph into two parts. And for the upper bound, you can prove that is two. I will not do that now, but but that's uh, where we come to the information theory. Uh, so let me. Uh, we have some other graphs here. We have C5 is an interesting one. This one is a, they are now sitting around a the table. There are five players, and they can see the two neighbors. It turns out that for this case, the guessing number is not an integer anymore. It depends on the alphabet size actually. Uh, and it turns out that every time you have a, the alphabet size is a square number, uh, they can achieve exactly 2.5. But what they're essentially doing, if you have a square number, of, or you can say they're throwing two dice, is what they're doing is that they're simply one dice value, they're, they're coordinating with the person to the right hand side, one of his dice, and the other dice they're co coordinating with the one to the left. So it's kind of guessing according to that, and then they can achieve a strategy of 2.5, uh, a guessing number of 2.5. And it was conjectured in general. Now I'm, now I'm just presenting results now. So for, for the, what, what, these have been pu published, most of these results, and, and presented in conferences and so on. But it was conjectured in 2011 that for triangle-free graphs, the best you can do is kind of just uh, uh, essentially the number of nodes divided by two. And it was consistent with some computer search that did up to a certain size. And it looks like it was natural. If, if you actually do sort of this kind of trick where you put people in groups and they try to, to guess, it turns out that that's exactly what you would guess. Even if you do it in, in fractional ways, so, so you have many dice to each player and some of the dice they share with some players and some with other players, it turns out you, get, you cannot get more than, you cannot get more than in half. So this is directed, it doesn't matter about... Bidirected. When, when I say undirected, it's really, it's really bidirected. It means you can see, both of them can see each other. So. So, so, for example, for this graph, uh, the Clemens graph, this is a specific graph we, we computed. This is joint work with Peter Cameron and, and a PhD student of, of, of mine. Uh, so we looked at specific graphs. 
And for this graph, it turns out that the guessing number is somewhere between 10 and 11 for this graph. The exact guessing number we don't know it probably is 10, but we don't know that. But, uh, but the point is that, uh, uh, so that means that if they're doing two colors on the hats, in some sense you can say they can do 1,002 to the 10 better than what you would expect. So they can do 1,024 times better than if they just do uncoordinated random guessing. So then we did the Hoff and Singleton graph, some other graphs. How do you get that yeah, well, then it's, it's a bit, that would be a bit technical to get into because it's in, in the paper, but the idea is basically you look at, uh, because you actually to get the 10, the lower bound you just get by providing a linear guessing strategy. And it's actually what you would call scalar linear. So the question was how we get this bound, the lower bound we get by a linear guessing strategy. And you can look at, that is actually given by some uh, rank of a matrix. And then you can calculate that for the graph, for the adjacency matrix where you have one null diagonal. This is a technical thing I will not explain here because it's... Uh, so but you be, use the term colors here, which you mean? Ah, yeah, yeah, colors before was dice values, I mean, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit... Oh, okay. This is the same, I mean, we just imagine like two colors. In this case, if, if it just used two colors or six colors or... Oh, I see, I see. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. So for this graph, the Hoffman-Singleton graph, Uh, we know the guessing number is somewhere between 29 and 35. Again, the methods are linear algebra and analysis of the, of the adjacency matrix. And uh, you work over f small finite fields, and then you are using also, we use computer also to, to, to support our uh, calculations. So in this case, it turns out that the graph have to have, the alphabet have to have size 5 to be successful. For, this, the lower bound was achieved by, by an alphabet of size 5. So we know that somehow the guessing number is between 29 and 35. And we have some other graphs here, and maybe I should immediately skip to, well, the M2 20 gra uh, graph is also interesting. It has some guessing number between uh, 54 and 77, and a postdoc of, of mine, uh, uh, he, I think I haven't seen the proof, but he says that he can argue that it's slightly less than 77, so it's like you can prove, you can bound it away by some infinitesimal from that, but otherwise it's unknown what the guessing number is here. Again, I mean, this is just to, to sort of, I mean, these numbers are not so impo important, but it's just to, so you get a kind of feeling for what's going on, that it's a sort of, uh, so if you have three colors, they can actually do much, much better. I mean, what, it, what is saying this thing intuitively is that if you're playing the guessing game there, and it turns out you actually use it as a uh, communication network also, it somehow has some surprising properties when it comes to coding functions, that this network actually allow some kind of, um, um, you can say, solutions for, for distributing messages and so on that is much better than you would expect. And, and this is a sort of the, maybe the most interesting one is the Sigmund uh, Hickman uh, Sims graph. It's a, it's a triangle-free graph. It has 100 nodes and 1,100 edges. But again, we know the guessing number is between 77 and 78. My guess is, I, I don't know actually, but my guess is it's 77. I mean, it's, it's just a... If it's, if it's more than 77, you have to use some non-linear coding functions, and it's very, very hard to imagine how one... So, so this conjecture is very false, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, this conjecture before well, that was published in 2011, despite the fact they used computers, and despite the fact that it was not just something they threw out, you know, it turns out to be false, and we, so we published that, you know, so it's, it turns out that the conjecture is false, because you simply... The idea was basically in the conjecture, is that when you play on triangle-free graphs, it's very hard to do anything more clever than just matching people up in various ways. But what this example show is that you can do clever things. Uh, so we have a, well, let me see. So this was for the Hickman-Sims graph. Let me just go to the, uh, yeah, okay. Let, let me explain what the relationship between these guessing games and causal networks. So, so suppose we have a simple uh, network like this. And now, I, did put, I didn't put it on the slides, but it's something I really like to think about. You, there are many physical systems uh, in Hamiltonian mechanics and other areas where you have lots of different components that sort of interact with each other. You have some pendulars and you have other things and they have some springs and it consists of different parts. And you want to, and the point is very often what happens is that the state of one part can be determined by some other states. 
And if you, for example, uh, and, or you can do something very, very simple. Suppose we have three different locations here. These are three variables. And suppose this variable is actually storing a mass, like in physics. Let's say it's non-zero, so it's not a photon or something, a mass. And it also, this node is storing a non-zero acceleration, and this one is storing a non-zero force. Okay? So now we have that, of course, that the force equals mass times acceleration. But what it means is that what you can see here is that you can kind of think about it like a causal relationship. So if you know any two of these, the third one is determined. So it puts sort of, when I say causal, actually it's a bit misleading because it not, doesn't need to be a uh, physical causation. It could also be a logical one based simply on some knowledge about the system. But the point is that in this case, this is actually, they could play the guessing game according to this uh, physical equation in some sense, you know, they just simply guess according to that. Um, but uh, let me see what the time is. So, so now let me link this up to entropy, because that's of course a real interesting thing, because the guessing games themselves look so recreational in nature. But what we want to do, suppose we want, we are interested in determining the maximal entropy of sort of a system like that. So we have like the guessing game with all these different nodes, it could be the Hickman graph or some huge graph, but we think about each node is some, is representing, uh, well, an alphabet, but the, the, the element in that alphabet assigned to that node is like the, the state of the node. And to say that it's in a station, and, and then we have like physical laws, we have laws in each node, it has there some laws that, that tells how that state is determined, can be determined from all the incoming states. So if you have a situation like this. There are some laws here defined by some function that determine what is that state. This is like an element in, in some alphabet. And suppose this is given by some law, so that means that if this is x1, x2, x3, then we can have f of x1, x2, x3 equals z. What it means is that there is a law, f, and that take these states, these are states in some finite alphabet, and they map these states into a state here. And to say that it's a stationary means that nothing is being shifted around. There's nothing dynamic, you know. We assume that the whole system is in a stable situation, so all these uh, are uniquely determined. But you can see that's exactly what you're doing in a guessing game. F here, instead of being a physical function or a physical law, it's just simply, you could think about it like a guessing function. And uh, in the guessing game, you want to maximize the number of fixed points in some sense, for this guessing situation. And that's exactly also what you want to maximize the entropy of the system. That's the uncertainty of the system. You want all the different outcomes to have the same symmetric probability, and you want to have as many as possible fixed points for your laws as possible. So what we can do is the way we can, it turns out that the maximal entropy for these are exactly the same as a guessing number. So. So the, how do we calculate the maximal the entropy of, of a system? Well, the constraints are simply, well, we normalize. So each node, just for the sake of this presentation or in general, we assume that each uh, node just belong to the same alphabet or have the same size, you know, it has the same uh, space. Then we normalize, so we assume that the entropy of, of a value in each in the alphabet is one. So what this means is that if you have a, if a, if, you have, if u is an in-neighborhood of a, a node j, then the entropy of j given u is zero. And then we have each vertex has, this is a normalization I talked about, has at most entropy one. And then the point is that this entropy is the same as a graph guessing number. This is exactly the same. If you calculate, if you maximize the entropy, you get exactly the same value uh, even if you allow different distribution over the, the inputs. I mean, the maximal entropy you, you can achieve over a certain size alphabet S is the same as the guessing number, and also in the limits, the two, if they exist, the two limits, and they are the same, and you let S go to infinity. So that means that you can say that the guessing uh, number of the game is the same as the entropy of the game if you define it in this way, like an entropic problem where you're maximizing under these constraints. So the guessing number for this one, we saw there is a, a strategy of 2.5 I mentioned before. This is the one where there are five people around the table. Uh, 
So what is the maximal entropy of, uh, of, of this graph? Well, we have these constraints. Uh, each of them, these are the, the uncertainty of each of those nodes is, is at most one. And then they are subject to these uh, constraints. And it turns out that you can actually calculate it for different alphabet size, you also get different uh, uh, strategies. It turns out if you have an alphabet of size two, they can achieve five fixed points. That's the number of fixed points they can achieve. And if you take logarithm of in base two of this, you get something like this. But 2.5 turns out to be the optimal. But for alphabet size two, you cannot achieve 2.5, but something less. Alphabet three by computer search and other things, it can, turned out to be 12. And then this, can, this is only 2.26. But for four, you can achieve 2.5. So, so when you talk about the guessing number, you're doing the, the lint soup? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, in general, you don't have to do the limb soup because uh, the, it exists. It oh, because I see you're just throwing out a value. Yes. And for these guessing, suppose you have, in some sense, you have two guessing numbers for a graph. You have the actual real guessing number, you get it asymptotically. For every single direct graph, there is a unique, det determined real number that is this guessing number. But you have a bit more than that. For every finite alphabet, you also have another guessing number that sort of can fluctuate a bit. But, it, but the guessing number is actually defined as the limit you get. That's like, uh, uh, so here I just don't want to go into these calculations. But but this is when you want to calculate the entropy for or give an upper bound for how well what is the entropy of the graph of, of five nodes. It turns out that you get uh, 2.5. But you need to use uh, Shannon's information inequality. So I'm doing it here. And if you don't trust my calculations, well, other people have also reproduced them. People have also proved in general for CN, where N is odd. But if you don't trust it, yes? No, well, in the beginning, of course, I was very concerned. I mean, what is, is it the same thing? Or is it, you are asking, the question is, did I relate it to Kerner's entropy and, and some other notions of entropy of graphs? Yeah. The point is, the best way for me, I got convinced that there's no relationship, is simply just calculate or look up what the values are for different graphs. And you can see there are different values. So it's simply, so, so it's not the same concept. Uh, but anyway, if you don't trust my calculations here, uh, here's a machine calculation of the same. Uh, it's also get five and a half. Uh, and this one I will skip because there have been many other talks about information theory. But the, the, the point I want to make is that we have these kind of non-Shannon information inequalities. There have been many other talks about it, so I'll skip uh, the this, this slides here. But it turns out that Shannon's information inequality is not the only one. There are all these hundreds of other in information inequalities that uh, are known to be true, but doesn't follow from Shannon's information inequalities. And uh, it turns out that this graph we found by computer, uh, this is joint work with, with four other co-authors. Uh, so it turns out that uh, for this specific graph, if you remove this edge, it's the only graph out of about 12 million undirected graphs we examined up to, uh, well, they are up, uh, of size up to 10. And this is the only example where there is a difference between the lower and the upper bound you get by using Shannon's information inequality. If you use Shannon's information inequality for all these other graphs, you get matching upper and lower bounds. But for this specific graph that is unique up to isomorphism, if you remove this one, actually, uh, that's why it's, uh, you have, yeah, we have removed it from 9 to 10. Then the Shannon bound, the guessing number you get from Shannon bound is 6.705. So that's like 6.705 we have here. That's the bound you get from by using Shannon's information inequalities. The best lower bound we have is, agree is in agreement with something called the Ingleton bound. That is 6. So we have an actually specific guessing strategy played on an alphabet of size 81. And that we might be, I think one should be able to prove, I don't know, I mean, it's very hard to say, but I don't think you can achieve, certainly not by in any linear fashion, you cannot achieve that guessing number except for alphabet size 81 or something. I mean, it has to be larger than that. But, but, for, but the lower bound is what you get by something called the Ingleton bound. It's a lower bound. What happens if you now take these new laws people discovered about Shannon's information inequalities and try to see, get the bound? And it turns out, if you take the classical, in, uh, the first known, so to speak, non-Shannon 
uh, information bound you get, then you get exactly this guessing number, or something like 6.696. Uh, what you can also do is that, uh, you know, Doherty, Frailing, and Seeger, they actually published, literally speaking, hundreds of different uh, non-Shannon information inequalities. Uh, these are all with four variables, I think. Uh, no, five variables, I think. Wait a minute, that was a... There were, there were the four variables one, by the way. Yeah, sorry, this was the four variables one, yes. And, uh, and they published hundreds of these. And the question is, if you used all of these ones, some of them improved the upper bound, but not much. You see, if you to, took all of them, we got the upper bound down from uh, this to this. So it's a very little improvement by, by using more than many hundreds non standard information inequalities. So there's a huge gap between that upper bound and that lower bound. So this is, of course, a big open question is, to, to, to make it smaller, that bound, and to understand the nature of it. Yes? Why is the open bound and lower bound in this case? You're asking why is the lower bound? Yeah, because you, you, you have a lot more variables. Yeah, the reason it's the lower bound is simply you run the Ingleton bound on the constraints, and then you get that bound. Okay? But you also have devised an actual strategy, a guessing strategy, a concrete one, and that, since it's linear and it actually have this guessing number, it, that's why, I mean, so, so you, so I think, so this was, I said, this is the only such example with a 20 million graph. On, and here is a little bit of a, some captures from this. Uh, uh, actually, I had two different programs for testing it independently of each other, uh, but one of them was using floats. Many, many linear programming, uh, programs for programming use floats, and that is, of course, useless here, because here we wanted rigorous proof in some sense. So, we actually ended up with rigorous proof in a sense that it's all integer arithmetic. Uh, so it's about 20,000 pages. And so, so uh, again, in principle, I suppose it's OK, because it's not, it doesn't matter it's generated by a computer, because a human, in principle, can also read it. You know, So it's, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not like these normal philosophical questions you have, can you trust the computer, and so on. I think in this case, you can just, the referee, you can just ask the referee, if there's a mistake, then the referee should be able to point it out, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, and there's another very interesting question that is, it turns out that you, if you add, I'm not going into the detail here, but you might ask, what if you have a directed graph and you reverse all the directions? Can that change the guessing number, or change the entropy of the graph? That's a very fundamental question. And it turns out it's still unknown, but what, what we know is that if you use the sh Shannon bound, that can change. So you can have a network where you just, when you flip one edge that is directed, you just take the same network as before, but there is one extra network in the middle that can see all of them. So to speak, there's one edge from each. One, the one in the middle has some extra information, can see all the other ones. It turns out that there is a difference whether you can see all the other ones or everybody can see that one. If you use Shannon's information inequalities, there is, you get either this bound or you get uh, 6.8. So you get dif different bounds. So I think I'm almost done. These are just kind of open questions. Uh, well, I don't know if we have time for that. That's a very curious thing. Maybe I can talk about it outside the lecture. It's, it's sort of a little bit of digression, but you might be interesting to, to what, what, what happens if you do these head games on infinite graph, and there is some curious things that is related to axiom of choice. And uh, I already had some heated discussion with one person here in the audience. So it's a... Uh, this is, I, I will just, you can, can just talk about it in the break, but I think uh, there are a lot of spin-offs of this research. I just want to point out a number of different things. A, we, for example, with Peter Cameron and Marx Godelow, we, we did a generalization of Matroid theory we published in the uh, combinatorial journal, and uh, we also did memories computation and dynamic networks and lots of other things. So some of these things have been published. Um, No, uh, it's, I think it's a little bit, again, it's, these links are, might be there, but it's underdeveloped. I mean, I mean, put it this way, that we haven't, so what you're asking about is there are some link between these kind of general, generalized matroids and, say, uh, entropic cones or things like that. I think 
our notion, probably not in that form, but I think there might be some CRMs that allows you to do it, but, but they need to, not in the current form of our results. Let me put it that way, so. Uh, any questions or? So maybe we should uh, have a break now. Or <coughs> so, thank you.